transformed into a thick blanket of smog, blotting out the sun, resulting in plummeting temperatures across the globe. 150,000 years after the death ray struck, life on Earth is in shambles. The few surviving species live in constant hunger. Nautiloids were once the invincible rulers of this domain. The killer whales of the Ordovician, now weak and sickly, they are desperate scavengers. For them, the world is vastly different. Year by year, the planet is getting colder and colder. What you're witnessing is the birth of a new ice age. Snow piles up at the South Pole, and over centuries, it compacts into solid sheets of ice, immense mile-thick glaciers that slowly march north across Gondwana, a supercontinent situated over the South Pole. The growing glaciers suck up vast amounts of ocean water, causing sea levels to drop by up to 200 feet. The water was taken from the oceans and sea level declined. The more ice, the lower the sea level. And eventually it drained the continents of their shallow seaways. And the organisms living in there had no living space. They died. The loss of the shallows wipes out more of Earth's population than the gamma ray burst itself. But there are still some surprises. In this new ice age, some animals prove remarkably resilient. Our ancient ancestor, Astraspis, follows the receding ocean water. This early vertebrate endures cold water better than other sea creatures. Even more critical to its survival is its indiscriminating palate, which allows it to eat anything that's available. If you're a picky eater, you are really going to be in trouble. You've probably had to eat almost anything to be able to get through one of these crises when food was at a premium. If you're a very narrowly adapted carnivore and your particular prey goes away, you're extinct. Astraspis is adapting, even flourishing, through the hardship. And soon an entirely new variety of fish begins to evolve. In these new species, the bones and muscles that form the first gill take on a new function sorting and moving large food particles down the throat. Every jaw in the vertebrate world, whether it's used for chewing cud, taking down prey, or the simple act of speaking, is the result of this remarkable adaptation. Another animal that's persevering is the eryptorid. This predator also followed the receding ocean water and managed to survive by taking over the nautiloid's niche in the food chain. Since Eurypterids are half the size of the nautiloids, they need far less food, a key to their survival. On coastlines across the world, the drop in sea level creates bizarre landscapes. The skeletons of coral reefs are now jutting above the surface. Where straight nautiloids once ruled, now a handful of weary survivors search the wasteland for any scrap of food. So many animals and plants are narrowly adapted, and any sort of cooling, especially for tropical creatures, is a death sentence. Take an enormous glass jar and put it over the island of Hawaii, cool it off for three months, and come back and see how many of those plants are alive. As the glaciers forge their way into the subtropics, huge icebergs appear. Beneath the surface, they threaten to destroy everything in their path. As mountains of ice steamroll their way toward the equator, coral thousands of years old is plowed over, causing massive devastation. A 
quarter of a million years into the extinction, sea levels continue to drop. And thousands of square miles of marine habitat are exposed to the harsh conditions of the surface world. Sun, wind, and rain erode the reefs, transforming them into vast, barren deserts. Year by year, life retreats with the receding ocean, condensed into ever smaller habitats. So this is forced migration. You know, this is migration maybe to a better place, but maybe not. Water temperatures, ocean currents would have changed. Conditions of a tropical world would have gone temperate and finally to frigid. So all of this would have contributed to extinction. An exploding supernova has brought horrific devastation to planet Earth. But this mass extinction is not over. Must not all things at the last be swallowed up in death? Plato, 4th century BC. It is now 550,000 years after the gamma ray burst. Freezing conditions have annihilated two thirds of the world's animals. But then temperatures rebound, the glaciers melt. Species that survived the Ice Age struggle through yet another extreme environmental change. As always, luck factors heavily into who will survive. As we look at the Ordovician extinction, the one thing that really stands out is that the best way to survive is to be very widely distributed. If the same species is present on five or six different continents, it has a very good likelihood of survival. If it's present only on one continent, it's very unlikely to survive. Straight nautiloids make a surprising comeback, but they're a shadow of their former selves. They used to grow to over 20 feet. Now they're half that. They are far weaker than their ancestors and under constant threat of attack. Unlike the once dominant nautiloid, the eryptorids have fared well through the extinction. The roles of predator and prey are now reversed. The oceans become a bloody killing field, but this time the eryptorids dominate. In this changing world, these sea scorpions are exhibiting a curious new behavior. Once they make a kill, they often drag the carcass toward shore. And incredibly, some of them are even venturing onto land. It is possible that the shifting sea levels may have accelerated the evolution of air-breathing book lungs like those in modern insects. Inside the eryptorid's abdomen are stacks of air pockets resembling a folded book. The scorpion's blood circulates through this tissue, pulling oxygen out of the air. An amazing adaptation born out of the will to survive. The mass extinctions are like dumping fertilizer on, on a newly weeded garden. You get a lot of stuff back. Some you can expect and some is totally new. 